the human brain seems to be designed to solve problems. This was said by Eric Jensen in his book, Teaching with the Brain and Mind. It should go without saying that correct and accurate practicing produces correct and accurate performances. Subsequently, if you practice mechanically incorrect gestures, you may be able to perform the work, but you will only perform it as far as those mechanically incorrect gestures will allow. So eventually, you will reach that proverbial brick wall and not be able to progress further. It is with this goal of performing at the highest level possible that we understand the need to develop what I call critical practicing. I define critical practicing as being self-directed, self-disciplined, self-monitored, and self-corrective in one's attempts towards seeking out solutions or strategies which advance one's performance to that to the highest level possible. Students who understand and use critical practicing work and listen rationally and reasonably while emphatically using the concepts and principles which enable them to analyze, assess, and improve their performance capabilities. Here are some guidelines that I've developed for critical practicing. All practicing should be based on assumptions. While you are exploring the historical context of a work, consider how this information is shaping your point of view, what you believe to be true about the work you are studying. To develop your point of view of a work, use analysis, listening, attending concerts. This background work is needed if one is to start the learning process with a full intellectual and oral understanding. All practicing should lead somewhere and have implications and consequences. Goal setting is the necessary tool in creating efficient and effective practicing. One should understand that improperly guided practicing will lead to performances that reflect those decisions. All practicing should have a purpose, so one should take the time to understand and clearly state why you are practicing a specific area. Like this, you could, for example, check every three days to be sure that you are still on the target you have articulated. All practicing should be based on facts. One way of obtaining these facts would be to record the passages you are working on. This will allow you to develop solutions based on the information, facts gathered from your listening to what you have recorded. All practicing should be an attempt to solve some problem. Because of this, we need to discover all the issues involved in the problem passages so that we might arrive at a solution, that we might arrive at solutions that are clear and, and as precise as possible. Understanding that all problems have solutions. All practicing should be expressed through and shaped by concepts and ideas. You see, Knowing practice strategies is only half the solution, as their appropriate use will determine the outcome of the performance. Practicing is a journey whose success depends on your creative solutions to the problems at hand. Learning to concentrate, learning to focus. Concentration is that state where you have focused your attention totally and exclusively on what you were performing at that moment. You see, when I was a student at Juilliard, Ms. Dilley once admonished me about my concentration when I performed. When I thought about it, I must admit to have been very confused by what she was saying. Because as far as I could tell, I was concentrating. 
But despite my concentration, I would play beautifully, then suddenly, inexplicably, mess up for a moment, and then all was well again. This is what she observed, and truthfully, even I could not understand at all why this was occurring, but it did, and frustratingly very often. So, I worked very hard on my concentration, but after a while, a few years, I saw that the problem still existed. It had to be something else. It was then that I realized that for me, what she meant by the word concentration, what she was trying to explain to me, was what I understood to be the word focus. I suddenly realized that I had to work on, identify what I was focusing on, and this would heighten my concentration. I had to understand that for me, concentration was that place where one is totally and exclusively focused on the tasks at hand. I now understand that this state of mind, focus, placement of attention, was what is needed to be creatively developed in my practice attitude in my practice scheduling. To show this, I made this graph for my students recently. The first circle is concentration. This circle is the starting point, or if you wish, the result. Next is the circle of awareness, which is within the circle of concentration. I mean, how can we concentrate if we are not aware of what to concentrate on? Now that we know what is happening, we can be in the focus circle. With this, we are almost there. Finally, we need to act on our focus. So we turn our attention to it and we are ready to go. Does this make sense? Why don't we see how this works by looking at a shift from the Vinyavsky Concerto in D last movement. That is the shift that goes from the A on the G string to the harmonic. So the goal is to get there efficiently and of course not miss it. So to accomplish this, I need to know where I am going. I first find the harmonic, like I just did, as its location is critical for obvious reasons. Next, I pull my hand away and see what I need to know to put it back in the same place to get the harmonic. It's now that I do something that's perhaps a bit unusual as I go from the harmonic back to the A. This is helpful to me finding a good path. What I mean by that is the way I go down, well, I return back the same way. I have found my pathway to succeeding in hitting the harmonic. It is through this that I can know what to focus on and then I will know exactly where to put my attention when performing the shift. I now know what to practice. As Tim Galloway says in the inner game of tennis, human beings significantly get in their own way. The point of the inner game is to reduce mental interferences that inhibit the full expression of human potential. So to learn to focus my attention in this way, it might help if I created a series of questions to ask myself while observing a problem. While observing a problem with shifting. First of all, how far am I going? Am I moving on the original finger or a new finger? Is it powered by my elbow? Am I sliding 
or jumping? Is the speed pattern from slow to fast or fast to slow? How is my wrist involved? You see, by answering these questions, we begin the creation of a mental model that we can use to focus our attention. Answering these questions can lead us to that larger state of mind that we call concentration. Doesn't this remind you of our little talk about problem solving? Stanislavski, who was a Russian actor and theater director, once commented on developing one's power of observation. To begin with, take a little flower or a petal from it, or a spider web, or a design made by frost on the window pane. Try to express in words what is in these things that give pleasure. Such an effort causes you to observe the object more closely, more effectively, in order to appreciate it and define its qualities.